So next up, we're going to move on um, to Raisa Azalini um, from Oxfam, who's going to give a presentation on the community perception tracking tool, which is a, a mobile tool, tool which um, is tracking and analyzing um, perceptions and perspectives from community members, especially during outbreaks. Um, Raisa, are you able to share your screen? So um, please go ahead. Hi, hey. Um Hi everyone. Uh, good good morning. Good evening. Whatever we are in the world, uh, and I'm sure you have a really long day. So thanks anyway for having me. Um, I'm just going to try to give you a really quick snapshots and kind of share some link if you want to have more information on this. And I'll definitely be available to answer other questions and more uh, in-depth uh, questions. I think that fits quite well with the different presentation we had on the um, fatigue of, of trying to collect a lot of data from uh, people in camps uh, or elsewhere. Um, so I'm going to talk about something else, another initiative that we had. And we call it the community perception tracker. So just to give you a bit of, of background, so the way we we um we had um developed uh, this process was very much linked to our community engagement commitment in our responses. So how we can build actually uh, a little bit more dialogue uh, with communities when we implement our activities, um, and then when we kind of also listen to communities a bit more. So we developed it in 2017, we trialed it in Haiti um, during the cholera outbreak, and then we definitely did a, a long um, pilot in uh, DRC during the Ebola outbreak in 2018 and 19 for uh, more than 12 months. And then we adapted it to COVID-19 last year, and then we have implemented across five different regions, uh, 12 countries in Oxfam and two countries uh, in ASEA. So what is the CPT? Um, so basically it's an approach uh, that uses a mobile phone. So it could be a, um, a telephone, an, an iPad um, that all staff and partners can uh, use while doing and um, the activities, while implementing the activities to capture, analyze and understand the perception of communities during this outbreak and to act upon it. So what is important here is that um, it is only relevant when you have already a program. So we're not collecting data for uh, doing some analysis on uh, social media, et cetera. We're really collecting data because we're having a program with the particular communities. And we want to make sure that what we're doing is actually accurate. It's, it's uh, acceptable. It's what people really need. And if not, from listening to what people are telling us, then we like to adapt it. So when we talk about perception, we really talk about questions, belief, concerns and practices that are in relation to the views or the perspective of people that rise in line of the spread of the disease. So as we speak, the CPT is very much oriented for disease outbreaks. So we're looking at the concepts and then we're saying, okay, in that particular outbreak, what happened to people? And they can come up with a lot of um, uh, information and not just about um, prevention or treatment, but also, for example, the impact uh, of that disease uh, can be on livelihood and protection, etc., or uh, the stigmatization. Yes, Sorry, yes. Let us check. Is your slide um, supposed to be moving? No, not yet. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, good. Um, and and the CBT is part of the dialogue. So basically, what we're saying is that. Um, that's why it's really important that we are doing a kind of all face to face. We can do it by phone, but at least we have a discussion with a with a person. Um, and we uh, we find out after 12 months of, of using it in COVID-19 that it really helps to develop also the trust that we have for the community we're working in. So there's a lot of tools out there. I think some some colleagues might have talked about it. There's a lot of approaches um, just to say that the CPT really look at people perception. And we're not looking at a specific sector. So it is not a wash tool, it's not a protection tool, it's not a livelihood tool, so food security, etc. It really is looking at the context. So our teams are using it and not just one single sector using it. So all the teams can be using it as long as you have an interaction with community members. It is not a survey. So we here we do not ask specific questions to people. I completely agree with one of you um, saying that there's a fatigue of asking questions. So here we don't ask questions. We are here really to listen. Um, you could have maybe a kind of a wider question. If you have an activities, um, 
on the ground with a group of people and um, the discussion doesn't go, um, it's not around COVID-19 and you want to know and understand what people are thinking about it, if, if that's something they want to talk about, you can have a broad question, but it will be a very general question. It will be not like a questionnaire, this specific questionnaire. So it is not a survey. Um, it is really an approach that provides a space for different people to be able to discuss what people are saying to us, um, coming from program perspective managers, um, monitoring and evaluation teams coming around the table and decided, okay, this is what people are saying, and this is how we should be adjusting our work. It's systematic because we gather information, it goes into a platform called Service ETO. Um, we, could do, we could look at the data on a daily basis, you could look at it on a weekly basis, bi weekly basis, or monthly basis, depending on how the outbreak goes. And it's systematic information. Um, we use a single form to enter the data and ICT, so it's quite easy uh, to record. And we're really focusing on qualitative data which are not the most easy things to always um, capture, use, and, and report on. Why are we doing this? Um, it's really because we, we think with the CPT, we can do um, better ongoing context analysis, so really understanding. So if you're in a camp, really, and if uh, you know that COVID-19 is a threat and it could be COVID-19, cholera, Ebola, et cetera, um, we want to know what people are saying about it and what kind of information is circulating around it. And you want to do that quite quickly and you want to do that quite systematically. So definitely better uh, context, ongoing context analysis to also um, from this data to really kind of go into recommendation and action. So adapt your programming based on what uh, people are telling us. And when it's not possible to adapt on your own programming, it's how you advocate and how you can also share that information in coordination platform and say, well, I'm in my organization, we don't do much about I don't know, medical, for example, but I think this is really important what people are telling us in, in this part of the camp or in that camp or another camp. And I think to have that discussion with, a, with other organization, I think that could be um, definitely useful. And also to monitor. So because we, we collect data on a regular basis over a long period of time, uh, you can also see the changes. So people think different things around, um, for example, COVID-19. Um, at the beginning, lots of confusion around the existence of the disease or the prevention or, or the treatment. And then suddenly, we saw in the last um, few months, uh, much more a discussion around vaccination, for example, or impact on livelihood. It's important that all this information, we, we triangulate that information with epidemiological data um, and other information that we can gather from our different programs as well. So how does it work? Um, basically, we have some data collection that happens during the activities. So the, the, the team are going outside, they have their already the activity plans, but not necessarily just focusing on, on that particular uh, capturing that information. But that during those discussions, that's where people can listen and hear people sharing. And as soon as you start listening, obviously people are more inclined to share. Um, that data goes up to service ETO, and then um, you have a first analysis that happened. Um, and then you can do first analysis, first recommendation, then you're sitting down in a meeting with your team. This is really where the moment where you can really discuss about um, on the, the result of the analysis, the finding of the analysis, but also what will be the action and recommendation and who will be part of following up. Uh, the triangulation of, with others are really important as well. So other organization, um, internal uh, sectors within the same organization, if they're not all involved. And then you adapt your programming or your influence and definitely do some follow-up activities. So I'm going to go very briefly. I'm not going to detail, but can I just jump in? Are, are you sure we're not supposed to be seeing your slides right now? As oh, yes. Sorry. Yeah, oh, yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Before. Um, we're still on the front slide. Oh, I I'm, apologize for that. Um, no can you see it now? Sorry. I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong. Can you see something? Uh, we still is still on the um, the title slide. No, so I don't know what's happening. I might just um, sorry for that. If you press from current slide on the top left, it should. Yeah, it just doesn't um, let me. So I can also share from my side if you want. Yeah, that would be great because 
not sure. You're sharing your screen, I can share mine. Can yeah, because I'm not sure. Let me just stop sharing. Sorry. Yeah. Definitely. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> You can, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, I won't go into much detail of that, but basically you have the different steps um, from the collection to really the full up of the activities. Um, next slide, please. So um, just to say that in, in, the, in the tool itself, you really have just like the name of the person who's collecting the information. And, and this is just because we want to be able to go back to the person in case we have not really understand, uh, understood the, the way the person has written the perception, because that's really like an open space for uh, writing perception. Um, the consent of the person who is uh, sharing the perception, which is really important. And then just few information that we need, for example, the location. So if you are, for example, in Bangladesh, we, where we work in many different camps, we have to have a, a bit of location of which camp, for example, in which area we're working. Um, the activity that the person has been doing um, while collecting the information. And then something around who is sharing that information. So uh, gender, age, uh, if the person is, li is living with disability or if the person also has been affected or not by COVID-19. And where the information that the person is sharing is coming from. So, but those are kind of um, uh, information that is needed to be able to do the analysis and to be able to, um, to understand a little bit more on the uh, um, who's sharing, who we're engaging the conversation with, et cetera. If you want to go to next, yeah. Um, so when we have the perception, so the person is, is saying something to us and we really have to record the perception the way the person is, is uh, telling us, then we have to categorize, uh, kind of tag that perception, code that perception into a categorization. And we have developed 12 categorization. It's just to help for the analysis because otherwise it starts to become a bit more complicated, especially when we look at data, um, qualitative data analysis. Um, and that really helps. So you can see here, we really, with the experience we had over the last 12 months, it was really a lot of things, there was some information were given about how to prevent from the disease, what, what's the sign and symptoms, um, um, access to the healthcare, the methods of transmission, obviously lots were around the origin and existence of the disease, which we've seen a lot in across the globe. Um, things around treatment, now more, more about vaccination, stigmatization, etc. And also um, including impact on livelihood, but also on, on, um, on protection issues, uh, on education, that the other things that we've been seeing. Next, please. So that's just a visualization. So it's coming out from the data, we could, for example, in, Bengla, in Venezuela, sorry, we could um, kind of visualize over the over the weeks what will be uh, what was the kind of main trend um, and thematics of, of the perception that we're coming up. And we could also see retrospectively when the perception is actually um, there's a lot of perception on certain thematics, and then suddenly they have appearance of new thematics. And you can also link it to what's happening in the context. So is the government has decided to do some lockdowns, is there more restrictions, uh, is a lift of, of the lockdown, etc. So you can definitely try and relate to the information, but also kind of see interestingly to see how um, uh, respectively, sorry, um, the people are, are being uh, sharing their perception. Next, please. So yeah, I think that's going to next. Yeah. You have to click. So um, is the CPT a cap? The CPT is very different. I mean, there's a lot of things around knowledge, attitude and practice survey. Um, it's very different because we are not looking at a very detailed information giving at a specific time. With the CPT, we really touch upon the perception people are, are ready to share about a specific context. And it's ongoing, but it is not very detailed. So if you want to have more information about something specifically if the people are, are sharing certain perception uh, on specific treatment, for example, that you want to explore more, then there's other, other methods, other participatory, other participatory approach that you can actually be using for that. Um, 
So that, that is not replacing a CAP survey. Uh, it is not an accountability tool. We're not just looking at if we're doing a good response or not a good response. We're not looking at safe pro, uh, safeguarding issues. Um, we're really looking at the perception in relation to the context. Um, and, and we're trying really to kind of focus on that. We have accountability tools. We have other means of collecting other data, but the, the CPT is focusing more on the perception on the on the specific context um, and it's not to address any follow-up on for example all the information that you have on social media like whatsapp groups or facebook etc because we need to tag uh, the perception to uh, somebody sharing it with us so men or women a group of men a group of women um, with the age etc so we need to be able to, to to tag the information to that so we're not doing that next please We did have uh, some challenging and some less learned, and I want to say that because um, even though it's a very simple tool, I mean, um, any organization could be using, we're, using, we're working a lot with partners, um, local and national partners, um, it's quite simple, but it does require a shift in the mindset of staff. So we are we were so used to do um, a lot of surveys, we are so used to ask a lot of questions that now to be in kind of a different seat and kind of say, to listen to people, it requires a different skills um, and it also requires for the, our team and our partners to be really confident. So um, it takes a bit of time, uh, especially during COVID-19 when we had to do a lot of things remotely, lots of trainings and mentoring remotely. It, it did take quite some time. Also, the team needs to be really confident of how to do the qualitative um, data analysis, uh, which is not always the case. So we kind of um, had to also take some time to, to, for them to feel confident. Um, it definitely requires capacity for the team to be able to transform the, the data collected into action. Um, and I think that's also something that we try to advocate towards donors to kind of try to be more flexible as much as we all want to do more community engagement, as much as, much as we want to all do more uh, in relation to what people are telling us. We also need to be having those kind of flexibility within our, our proposal with our donors because we, we can't necessarily think about everything. Um, but definitely, I mean, the, the program uh, team is leading on this. So for us, it's important that um, it's part of the day-to-day -day activities, so building the trust with the communities, but it's also recognizing that management has a really important role to play. Um, the tool is cross-sector, and definitely for, for management perspective, if you have different organization working in the camp, um, if they're using, a, the same tool or something similar, at least you could be able to have a, a kind of overview of what's happening, for example, in the camp in relation to a specific uh, context. Um, I think the CPT, the one, one added value was that it has, it has provided some space for different teams to discuss, um, including with partners. So really looking at not necessarily their own sector and what they're also looking at in, in kind of the daily um, activities, but kind of really open it up and kind of seeing, trying to see it through the perspective of people who are not necessarily thinking in terms of sector. Um, and I think one of the things that was really important and it did work very well in, during the Ebola outbreak was also to really um, be able to share it in coordination platform on a regular basis. So we're doing that not necessarily very well across the board, um, but we're trying to find the right platforms, um, coordination platform to, to be able to share um, the, uh, the information that we're collecting. Next, please. And I think our way forward um, is, is definitely that we want to continue to support the CPT in COVID-19, but also um, that we want to also develop the CPT beyond disease outbreak. So I think our next step, at least um, within Oxfam, is really trying to look at maybe um, armed conflict, uh, natural disasters, um, political economical crisis to kind of really open it up and not just focusing on, on disease uh, outbreak. And we have our, a current research program at the moment with the London School of Hygiene, Tropical Medicine and ICF. So all the learnings, hopefully all the findings from that research project will be also integrated in the, into the new CPT. If you do have any questions, um, you can reach me or you can also go onto a website. There's uh, some case studies, some videos, um, more information around the CPT. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Rosa. Let me just <clears throat> stop sharing my screen. Um, okay, let me just have a quick look in the chat to see if there's any um, questions from the audience. Um, so one says, um, yeah, in some of our CCL operations, we use what is called rumor tracking. Um, so I guess it, it, it's similar but different because instead of tracking sort of like hearsay that you hear in shops, you're actually asking people a question on how they feel about a certain topic and getting their perspective on it rather than rather than the sort of like Chinese whispers you might hear um, down the market, um, which I think is quite interesting because I think within CCCM, <clears throat> we, we are very much interested um, in this kind of information. It sort of falls between camp management and protection. And when those two actors are working um, together and have sort of like common information collection um, and community engagement sort of programming, we do tend to get this information um, out um, embedded in sort of like different incident tracking kind of tools where rumors and negative perceptions um, fall, fall into that. I think if you're asking which coordination platform you would present this to, I mean, I think have have you have you worked with CCM actors in presenting this tool um, or, or camp managers? Can you share a little bit about it, your experience on how they took it or how they use that information um, at a response level? Yes. Um, so just to go back on the rumor tracking, when we developed uh, that in 2017, we, we called it rumor tracking. It's just I don't like the word rumors because for me it has already um, a connotation, kind of judgmental aspect of it. So we tried to find something a little bit wider and just uh, a little bit neutral, but it, it is very similar. Um, but as you said, we, we're having the discussion and some people are saying, I heard that on, on WhatsApp or I heard that from my neighbor or I heard that on TV, but at least what we're interested about is how they internalize the information. What is their perspective? Because when we know their perspective, we, we think this is how we're going to be able to engage with you. And if there's a need of changing behavior, this is how we can actually have that conversation with you. So I think that that's probably the difference. Um, experience. So we, we um, have uh, the CPT. Uh, for example, in Jordan, in Zatari. So I think my colleagues have been sharing that. So going into coordination mechanism, sitting down, um, presenting that to um, whoever's leading on, on the coordination, could be uh, you know, Shia or other actors. Um, I think some people are always very interested, not necessarily because they will be interested that they will be definitely be doing it. I mean, everybody had a lot on their plate, a lot of priorities, a lot of work. Um, but I think by, by starting sharing the information, sharing the data and coming on a regular basis, I think that's also some, some organization realizing, well, okay, that's something also we can take on board and we can do it within our own um, organization. Uh, places like Bangladesh was a little bit more challenging at camp level, but then, then there's a lot of different um, more kind of general and maybe sector platforms. So that's where we're sharing. So they were, so we did a presentation and they actually, actually asked us to do a bulletin, so a monthly bulletin, so we could share that because there's a lot of actors, lots of information happening. So I think they wanted something like in writing on a regular basis that give us the um, uh, what are the data that we are seeing? What are we doing with the data and looking at the big trends? I think at that level, it was probably more uh, kind of um, at a macro level than a micro level. Um, in ITS, so we work in an informal settlements in Lebanon, for example, um, there we, we, we do uh, share uh, with a sector. So that is more oriented versus sector because that's also the way the coordination mechanism is set up. So it really depends. And it could be a national level or in the Beka Valley, for example. Um, but I think also one aspect is important is that that information, we should be able to share it back with communities. So what we do, for example, in Venezuela, it's not camp because we, um, uh, with the migrants, we're working a bit differently. But basically what we're trying to do is, is how do we package that information has been analyzed back uh, to the community and themselves, which informs their own action plan. But you could have something similar in, in a camp setting. I mean, that, that definitely is something to, to be looking for. It's not yet uh, being applied uh, in the last few months. What would you do if the perceptions under, that you were, you were sort of receiving through this tool um, were things such as, um, you know, that, you know, sort of these very, this, you know, COVID conspiracy theories, you know, that, you know, vaccines cause infertility, Bill Gates wants to microchip you, et cetera, et cetera. Like, how, do you translate that back into, when you talk to the communities, do you try and dispel 
some of these more problematic and dangerous sort of not rumors, but you know perceptions that might be proliferating um, at a at a camp level. Yes, but the thing is, I think we learn is is that if you if you receive that, you can't just to say, well, actually, it's not true. So we know that it doesn't work. So I think it's good to have the information. So we really tell our teams to, um, for me, there's not a bad or good perception. There's a perception, but now we have to act on that because sometimes a perception can be based on uh, science data or, or non-science data. So I think that's where we have, when we do the analysis, we have to be also very cautious about what we're saying, um, but definitely that's exactly the plan. So basically it's, it says, I think what's interesting at the camp level for me would be to have different actors using it and then coming together and sharing. So, and then maybe in that part of the camp, people are saying certain things, but maybe another part, they're actually saying something else. So it would be interesting also in terms of, how we do our programming um, would be, and what are we doing that maybe works in that part or doesn't work on the other part. But definitely that's part of the um, of our work. So basically the, the vaccination promotion activities in Lebanon have been based on the data given by the CPT because we were collecting data on the on regular basis. Then we had data on our hand to have this discussion and then we decide, okay, we need to do something about it. But then the people are telling us that they're not, they're not just telling us they're afraid because if they get vaccinated, they die, or they're afraid because they have so many side effects. Or they uh, they were also telling us, well, yes, we could be interested, but where do we go to register? Are we allowed to have vaccines? So all the different questions came. So what when we had the data and we analyzed the data, then it was very easy for us to translate that into a promotion uh, plan. So which um, what they, they've been doing now. So I think now we're trying to duplicate that in other countries. Thank you, Rosa. That's really interesting. 